to say, since part of my job is to launch ArtLink, the relevance of ArtLink to me, and I guess to many people, but to me, is that it, um, it's really broad ranging uh, in, and it covers many positions across the gender landscape. Now, that's really valuable to me. You can't keep up with everything. And uh, it, this is very valuable for me to hear voices that I don't have a chance to hear. And if you do know my work, you do know that it is uh, very diverse. I move, you know, and pretty much I always have. And I haven't actually been afraid to move, even though it seems, you know, there was a time when my galleries, after that very first show, public show that um, Joanna talked about where, and it wasn't simply about female, uh, the female organ. This one goes with another, which is uh, a, a phallus. And the, the inspiration that came from it was to have a female organ and a male organ. My battles back then, our battles, were uh, censorship, this is back in the 60s, censorship and the question of, you know, what is art? What is art really in the face of, at that time, advertising? The ongoing questioning of art and what it is and what it can be, what it is when it's acceptable to certain institutions, what, is, what it is when it's not. That remains constant, and I'm constantly moving in all sorts of ways around and through and backwards and forwards. And what I was actually doing was, I had actually found that a lot of those conventions that I'd learned it about in art school didn't hold up in practice. When I, in, in this sort of investigation of what it was to be an artist, I actually started going back and cutting through and breaking down and going in the opposite direction of all those conventions that I'd you know, learned about in art school. And, and the ideas could be anything from the banal to the magnificent, the sublime, the political, the whatever. I, you know, I'm not an activist in the same way anymore, but I see, I look at my work and I see it all there. It's political in that way that um, we as feminists did recognise. You know, it's not really consciously subversive, and yet it is subversive when you analyse the processes and so on that, you know, go along with it. But it's about being and living and searching and, you know, that process actually can take you through to something that does open out into an insight, an insight that's not just gone through conventional ways, but gone through the back alleys and, you know, the bypasses and rejected areas as well, and can bring together a uh, you know, some sense of what it is to be human in a, in a, in a really quite, uh, in a very satisfying way. And I think that why I've taken the time to talk about my practice is because I think that this kind of practice is the kind of practice that feminism had a lot to do with opening up. And I see the diversity, the moving around, so much of my practice as a result of those questions that we asked about, you know, if, if we live within this thing called patriarchy, and so everything is affected by that, then what else is there? And of course I knew enough about the establishment, and I never wanted to lose touch with it. You know, I did a lot of community work. It was never my goal.
goal to just disappear into community. My goal was to get in touch with people's creativity. When people talk about feminism no longer being relevant to them, I just think, well, you just got to step back a few years and all this stuff that you take for granted um, actually didn't exist. Actually, we started to work toward a, towards this project for the Ad Adelaide Biennale uh, and we didn't get the gig and so we decided to do it anyway. Um, and we decided to make it a festival. We decided to make it a festival that would inc include an exhibition, um, a, a whole series of performances from contemporary dance um, to performance art, and then quite a massive public program. Um, okay, so this is the work by Parachutes for Ladies and Jessica Oliveri. Um, and in this case, the Parachutes for Ladies are opera singers and other kinds of singers. And she worked with a um, composer to devise a number of uh, songs that were sung over the top of one another about um, acceptance in the church of gay marriage. Ah, Philip Brophy. Um, Philip Brophy is one of my favourite artists in Australia. Um, this is a, a live performance that he did at the opening of Sexes uh, called Stadium. Um, and he drags himself onto stage as a sort of cadaverous kind of rock god and starts to play the drums. And he's an amazing drummer. Um, but the kind of the, the work that he made for the exhibition was like a, a, a three screen kind of surround sound um, uh, work which kind of um, looked at all of the kind of imagery of cock rock of the 80s um, and crashing waves and dancing girls and. This is uh, a ceramic poo by um, Trevor Fried, and so he's made all of these sort of uh, totemic kind of phallic objects, and I think this is kind of one of the biggest installations of those objects that he's ever done. This is work by Eric Bridgman. Um, this is the shrouded version of the work that he did for the exhibition. That's an unshrouded work, but um, there we go. Um, this is a project that he did fusing the heads of um, uh, AFL footballers onto porn star bodies. Um, he was looking at the kind of hypersexualization, but also the kind of uh, the sort of backlash of that sexualization of sports stars in Australia. Marley Dawson did a beautiful work, and you can't really sort of get the the scale of it here. But through the carriage works, there's this amazing um, uh, uh, gantry uh, that has. Um, uh, a series of machines that still are uh, operable that run through it uh, and so he got the sort of the, the t these little turbines to start working again and the, these massive sort of um, wheels above your heads and then he got this it's called a drive shaft that's why it was kind of a sexist thing. It's kind of about the sexualization of this kind of industrial space. Uh, and then he got this massive kind of uh, wheels to actually turn this very small um, lathe with a very tiny coin on it. Um, this is work by Chidam Idemir. You can see Chidam hovering just up ahead. Um, she made a burqa for um, one of the passageways of the carriage work, so it actually covered about 20 metres worth of walkway and totally enclosed it and um, for several performances she installed herself um, in the burqa. Um, this is work by Liam Benson on the right. Um, he makes work with really sort of Australian, it's like twisting Australian um, iconographies uh, of masculinity and femininity. This is work by um, Sangeeta Sandrasega and Luke Parker. So this is, a, this is an exquisite corpse work between two artists um, who sent each other um, through the mail um, uh, images of, uh, of the body that would um, change. Um, this is a work by Julie Rapp, um, in fact two works uh, which we brought together through time. So um, the work on the wall is called Hair Rail and that work she actually showed um, in 1992. Um, it's, a, it's a collection of hair that's inside this um, acrylic uh, rail. It's very beautiful and it looks like it was made yesterday um, and it still has that same sort of like tactility and this idea of this abject um, thing inside. Um, and, she, and she showed it alongside Stepping Out, which is a new series of bronze feet which were made after a series of images that she made in 
early 2000s, I think 2002. Uh, this is work by Natalia Hughes. And Natalia made this work for the women's show at GOMA. And we asked her if we could sort of take part, because it was like this quite um, elaborate room that she created with a dinner table and with really overstuffed chairs. Um, it was something that we kind of wanted to bring something of inside of the exhibition um, and she's, uh, she's made this uh, wallpaper. This is work by um, Christian Thompson um, who is a Indigenous artist and he made this work um, about five years ago when he was living in Amsterdam and he kind of does sort of like a reversal of the, um, the kinds of images that I guess we're used to seeing in sort of Heidelberg down on his luck kind of era. Um, painting um, and places himself as an indig indigenous man in this sort of um, European forest context. Um, these few works are by John Mead. He's a sculptor from Melbourne and he starts with form that turns into these kind of gendered things. Um, and this is a still from uh, work by Pilar Mata Dupont and Taryn Gill who are artists from Western Australia that make work uh, kind of based on um, the sort of perfection of gender seen in um, films uh, by Leni Riefenstahl and prop propaganda films of um, the, that uh, era of Nazism and fascism in Europe. This is work by Paul Knight. Um, it's a diaristic uh, work of many, many images that sort of range from very sort of banal images of, um, of uh, serving dinner uh, in the lounge room to sex images to holiday images. Um, and accompanied by a soundtrack. And then we move to performance. This is work by Julianne Long, uh, who's a very senior performance and dance artist um, in Sydney. Uh, this is a project called Something in the Way She Moves, which is about the invisibility of uh, middle-aged women. Um, this is a, a panel that we put together um, around um, uh, gender play. Um, called Insight, and it was based on Jenny Brockie's Insight, only with Pauline Pants Down playing Jenny Brockie, and Insight spell, spelled I N C I T E. Um, and all of the participants are um, performers that uh, play with gender identity. So, in a nutshell, it was essentially um, three painters, uh, three uh, women painters based in Tamworth, had got together and wanted to do a show. Uh, and it was an interesting proposition because the show had an idea uh, behind it, a theme, uh, which was to ask the question whether female painters brought something to the subject of landscape painting that was measurably different to those of, of male painters. Uh, but how this might play out and how it would work, I wasn't sure. So I began to do some research and some reading and, and soon found that the idea that perhaps uh, there was a feminist discourse on nature and on landscape painting in particular was very much a work in progress. Uh, I've actually found a text uh, by an American uh, feminist author named uh, Stacey Aelmo. And so uh, reading it eagerly, I soon discovered that there was no easy or short answer to, to that question. That the idea that uh, nature as a subject, although gendered in, 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 in very fundamental um, respect, um, was not necessarily one that had been theorised as, uh, as a subject in feminist art. So the three artists who, were, uh, who had put this idea together with, were Michelle Hungerford, Charmaine Pike and Gabrielle Collins. And so I decided to look at the stylistic continuity of the works in the show um, and to look at other female painters who may uh, connect stylistically and add something interesting to the show. And so I was first, uh, I first thought of Joanna Logue, who is a, uh, an artist from, who shows here in Sydney at King Street Gallery. Uh, my friend um, Carrie Miller suggested that I look at the work of a painter who was then based in Melbourne named Amber Wallace. And one of the first things that really caught my eye was that Amber had had a show called I Fuck Mountains, which is an incredibly spectacularly provocative title uh, for a show on landscape. And so we went to, to visit Joanna, um, who is seen here, 
with her Italian greyhound named Cinnamon. Um, Joanna works directly from uh, studies that she conducts in the landscape, in the old style, the en plein air of drawing, but also she takes photographs of areas that interest her. I think probably one of the most fascinating aspects of her practice is how much of it is based in photography. Uh, she works very often from photographs and works to deliberately translate the photographs onto canvas. Uh, and so when you see these paintings in, this, in the gallery setting, or also in her studio, they have a very abstract uh, quality to begin with, but as you s sort of take a few steps back, they begin to coalesce before your eyes into, into landscapes. She was also experimenting with painting from memory, trying to um, recreate for herself the sort of sensuous relationship we have with the, our favourite places. Here are some photographs that she had uh, taken of the bridges from which she worked, and they were very much, uh, the, you know, the source material for these for this series. I visited Michelle Hungerford, who has her own prefabricated uh, studio space on her on her property. She likes to work at scale. She is a uh, true en plein air painter. A lot of the work she does is, is based uh, entirely on sketches and material that she's produced in the land, traveling out to, to record things. This is the entry to the studio of uh, Charmaine Pike, who uh, at this time, although I think she's about to move, has been living uh, out with her parents. One of the things that really intrigued me about her work when I first saw it was that it seemed to have a very uh, immediate connection to Philip Guston in the way she put her stuff together. But uh, when I mentioned it, she kind of said, please don't say that name, I hear it all the time. And this is, uh, this is uh, Gabrielle Collins' uh, uh, studio. On the, on the wall behind her there, there's some of her paintings of, uh, actually of Sydney Harbour. And um, she's working at kind of, you know, postcard size. Classic artist studio, working through um, sketches first, um, on plein air stuff that she was doing at small scale, bringing this material back to the studio. I mean, it's classic painter's stuff. So what was the outcome of all of this? Um, one of the interesting things about talking to uh, the painters, to the artists, was that they did not as ascribe to the idea that they were feminists in a political sense. <coughs> Yet it seemed to me that everything that they were able to do was much, as Vivian described before, the outcome of a, of a set of circumstances. And so the curatorial question wasn't so much a question of trying to deduce or determine some measurable optical difference between the work of male painters and female painters, but rather to ask what the context was of these artists asking the question and being artists in the classic sense. So in terms of what constitutes a career, the five women were, I think, representative of a range of possible career positions, but also, and I think in a real and meaningfully, a meaningful and fundamental way, were in a position to be artists, to be uh, the artists that they wanted to be, and to also engage with a genre of art making which, as we know, has been traditionally dominated by male artists, even, even now. And so the question of the exhibition, was there a, a feminine view to the work, was yes, yes there was, but it was as much found in the role of being an artist as it was in the work that they were making. So this is some of the pieces that Amber produced for the show. Her work is, is quite interesting, it kind of, it, it, one, my big conceptual idea for including her in the show was that unlike the other artists, she was interested in the idea of landscape as a genre and a lot of the work that she had done previously was entirely, you know, the invention of her mind. This one painting here is like an example of, is an example of that, uh, of that imaginative space. These earlier ones are, are, are kind of free form interpretations of, of actual space. These are some pieces of, of Charmaine's, uh, Charmaine Pike's in the, in the uh, exhibition. You can still see the you know who influence in the work, but still very strong in its own terms. And I think 
a logical visual progression from from uh, from Amber's painting. I would skip around to the other end of the exhibition, and this is an install shot of uh, on the uh, on the right there. That's Joanna Logue's painting, and on on the left, you can just see on the other wall one of one of uh, Michelle Hungerford's paintings. Um, this again, I hopefully kind of represented a, a, a logical stylistic continuity in the exhibition. This is one, the one bridge painting that made it into the into the exhibition. Uh, on the right there, on the left there is one of her memory memory landscapes. A number of small works there, the trio of small works. This is another of Michelle's, although in colour this time. The black and white landscapes. And this uh, rather gorgeous sequence of paintings, uh, there's actually about 10 in the series by uh, Gabby, by Gabriel, uh, Gabriel Collins. And her big works, her, her paintings of the landscape in Tasmania. Um, 